history of Malaysia, security framework and apparatus. So, as you all know, this is a very huge topic, it's a large topic. Uh, but thankfully, the organizing committee has settled down with two very good research questions, which I will address mainly from the point of ethical science and legal history. Um, I'll be using a central argument. Uh, it's fairly uncomfortable to speak like that. Uh, I'm go going to the three eras and themes of Malaysia's security apparatus and framework, basically communism, communalism and counter-terrorism. Then I'll look at the state of Malaysia today. Uh, if I have time, I'll have a comparative overview of how Malaysia's security framework compares, especially historically with uh, our neighbours. So basically, I mean, if I were to answer the first question is that with Malaysia's emergence as a sovereign state, taking place amidst insurgency and regional politics conflict, followed by domestic political and political upheaval. What is the relevant historical background to Malaysia's security framework and apparatus? The second question, which I'll look at in a more preliminary way, is how does the NSC and Malaysia's security framework and apparatus measure up to comparable institutions, particularly in states facing clear and present security threats. So here's my central argument. Um, Malaysia is inherently a strong state, although we like to say that Malaysia is a failed state, but then the fact that the government can impose rules and the government can impose control over large swaths of its territory, that makes Malaysia a very strong state. And that is why there is a concern about this NSA Act, because the government can actually impose control if they want to. So uh, this is why the government can maintain a total approach, which is argued by Andrew Humphreys in his thesis in the security framework. So what do we mean by a total approach? Basically it means that to impose security, the government doesn't really just use people with guns, like police and the army. It uses a lot of the bureaucracies within the government, uh, be it religious or non-religious, and then security policy, policy pervades uh, all realms of policy making, like including education policies, cultural policies, foreign policies, and so on. So there are two major modes in Malaysia's security apparatus. The first is coercive, basically law enforcers, uh, judges, persecutors, and second, ideological. As we all know, uh, with our religious bureaucracy, with the Bureau Tata and Nagara, and so on and so forth. So that's how you got a very totalized approach. So what is particular about Malaysia is that there's this very strong ethno-religious overtone that presides over security policies and conservations. Uh, this is first thing considering the fragmented nature of Malaysian politics. You know, ethno-politics is it's quite prevalent uh, even until today. And there's a one-sided dilemma that's faced by the Malaysian security framework uh, as argued by McCormick. It's basically they are balancing the sort of feelings of security and insecurity between different communal groups. And because of the way the state is oriented uh, on a rather ethno-communitarian way, so it becomes one-sided because it always has to balance and when it comes to balancing, it always goes disproportionately towards one group or the other. But then there's a lot of balancing going on. That's why Malaysia has a very long-lasting collision government until today. It's one of the longest-lasting in the world. Um, so when we go into the communist insurgency period, it is the most definitive era in the conceptualization and institution of Malaysia's security framework and apparatus. Because as we all know, Malaysia as we know it today doesn't really come as a, as, as a given. So in 1948, there's only a time where all the, the West Malaysian states came together and formed a federation, a rather centralized one, and it is also coincidentally during the time we are facing, the state is facing an existential threat, basically the communists. And that's where you have a very centralized police force, very centralized policy making, and that is the time where the police became basically a major instrument for regime preservation. Because they are trying to fight a war in, in the form of an emergency, so the police is deployed heavily. Uh, if you look at the casualty data, actually more police men uh, and women died fighting the communists as compared to the army. And it was during the time that Malaysia had actually two times the number of police personnel as compared to now, even though the population is so much smaller than. So, and due to the fact that the, the communist, the membership of the communist 
uh, insurgents are predominantly ethnic Chinese, and also due to the fact that a propaganda war has to be waged to so-called win hearts and minds. An ethnic dimension was also infused into Malaysia's security outlook. So to have a snapshot during the time when our security policy or framework or apparatus is being formed, there are two major pre-obsessions of the state. First thing is this thing on the international and even on the establishment side. You have to uh, look at the, the prevalence of the domino theory during the time. And of course, Malaysia being an uh, ethnically segregated uh, community, it also infused a lot of ethnic stereotypes in terms of what they think as terrorists. This is what my master's thesis is about. How do ethnic stereotypes would work into this whole definition of terrorists? It's not very different from now. You look at how people so-called link Muslims to terrorists today. So it's not very different there. Um, and then we have communalism. Well, it's not to say that uh, ethno-religious politics isn't very important before that. But then it's like after the communist threat, we uh, the exist, exit of pass from the Barisan National Collision, which is followed by a wave of Islamist revivalist politics. Uh, this is especially after the Ulama takeover of the past leadership. Uh, it forced the government to revamp its security policy and maintain this obsession towards uh, something called Muslim unity. That's why uh, in the 1984 government white paper, you can see that Muslim unity and national security basically are placed on equal positions. Well, this is, this is understandable because the security apparatus had to contend with past as a dominant electoral force because past is basically contesting without no on the same grounds. And of course, during the time, there's various fringe elements like uh, crypto group, the Mamadi group, Jundula group, which do not want to adhere to the dominant hegemonic order as defined by Amno, and a lot of them want to fight them through violent means. Um, this contest of, of Muslim unity so called leads into this fight over who defines what is right and wrong Islam, and that leads into the security domain. Basically, you can see that in the crackdown of a lot of purportedly deviant groups. And a, a prominent example would be Darul Akam. So you can see that the, the total approach in work then, first the religious bureaucracies first uh, announced a fatwa saying that this is the Darian group, and then that's where the security uh, apparatus moves in and crack down on the group. So um, my thesis basically argued that around that time, I mean the period of communalism I talk about, that the government actually called a lot of these militants deviants because the term Called terrorist is heavily ethnicized and linked to the communist terrorist, which has certain ethnic overtones. But then the, the onset of the war on terror changes this, because there's this, this global swamping of the discourse of terror, and it allows Malaysia to strategically position itself as a key anti terrorist ally. So this is the time whereby you see that, because before that, our working definition of a terrorist is only one paragraph in the ISA, which was subsequently repealed in 2012. So you see that there's a massive expansion of legal and penal codes to stem activities related to terror. So the state is heavily defining what does it mean by a terrorist. And yet at the same time, because of this concentration of power and consolidation of, of, of state security apparatus, it understandably gives up a very concern due to the passing of laws such as the NSA Act, which we're going to talk about today, as well as the various amendments that we made throughout the past few years, like the Penal Code Section 124B and the recently amended Sedition Act. So, what we've seen in this period is that there's, I mean, especially in the current administration, is that there's a gradual hardening of of uh, ways of dealing with uh, militants. Because last time, that because they have been seen as deviants, so a lot of things, these people are detained by the ISA and they are rehabilitated and released back to the society. But if you look at how the government deals with the situation right now, is that there's a lot of them quickly to be charged in court. So basically, you're punished for it and you're punished in a rather high profile manner. So, of course, there's, there's a good and bad here. I mean, not, not to say good and bad, but some considerations is that the first, the rule of law actually prevailed in some of the cases because these people are charged and not detained indefinitely. But the second thing is that um, some people would argue that the hard approach might not work in so-called counter-terrorism uh, 
operations. So what is the state of the nation today? How does the state operate its security framework and apparatus today? So basically we are seeing the state, the Malaysian state, are coming to terms with a larger history. Basically something that's created by the digital boom. boom. So this is, this is the realization not only that comes after you notice that a lot of people are being radicalized online. You also face, the state also face that there's a harder way to control, it's more difficult to control the set when you have a larger unexplored terrain online. I mean, they feel it after 2008. But then you've seen that uh, it is quite effective in a way in trying to institute controls over these kind of terrains. And that's why a lot of laws have been passed, and that's why you see a lot of these militant groups are being broken down. Uh, successfully, I mean, even though they commit, communicate to WhatsApp, Telegram, and so on and so forth. So at the same time, when the state is trying to institute control, there are things that they can't control. For example, even though Malaysia participated in the Southern Philippines peace process, it still has no control over the re region, and whatever happens has security implications on Malaysia. And also the Middle East, with all this sectarian warfare, proxy wars, and so on. We have no control over that. We can only try to balance ourselves and things. But because of the flow of information now, because of the prevalence of communicative infrastructure now, we just need to deal with it. We can't control and dictate what happened there. As compared to the other groups last time, just with Malaysia, if there's a crackdown, there goes. So I will argue that uh, starting especially from the early 80s, this increasing Islamization of security, which whereby the state dictates what is right and wrong Islam, and use security framework in terms of uh, dealing with people they think are on the wrong side, it uh, sadly causes the securitization of Islam as well. So what do we mean by that is that if you look at the, the discourse about ISIS in Malaysia today, it's more or less about Islam, whether they are, they are following the wrong school of thought or anything. So it's very hard for people to go to the root causes of that because people just keep on harping on religion about when talking about these kind of issues. But this is not particular to Malaysia because you have uh, other countries like France and USA who's talking like that. But then Malaysia is because of all these years where by security is defined, in religious terms, it makes the state and even the interlocutors very really hard to escape from that. Uh, but fundamentally what we are seeing is that is we are looking at a state that has to deal with a situation where the ruling regime is not very popular uh, and that the law and order card becomes very important because if you can show that he's the one who provides law and order, uh, that there is where you can win some legitimacy there. So I'm going to look at the brief, very brief comparison of the nation is that as to how the French police is the consequence of French republicanism, or even the American police is the form of uh, is the legacy of the sort of politics they have. History strongly determines the type of security framework and apparatus of the country. I mean, Malaysia is heavily defined uh, by the communist. Um, Insurgency. That's why until today you only have about 9% of the Malaysian police in the criminal investigative department, but you have about 30% of the police personnel still in the public order and internal security dimension uh, department. So Malaysia faces a much more complex scenario due to the position of Islam in its political security order. Well, this is not very unique to Malaysia as well. I mean, look at countries like Saudi Arabia and so on. They did because of how the state oriented itself. It, it has to grapple with all this, uh, is, with Islam as a master signifier, as something that everyone can contest. I mean, even the militants are contesting the legitimacy of the state using Islam today. So that's something uh, countries like Canada and so on doesn't need to face. So I would argue that if you want to look at, have a more comparative overview of religious security policy or framework, you can compare best compared with Singapore and Indonesia. Are both our neighbors. So Singapore um, is a state that tries to maintain a very strong secular facade, and that is why it is galvanizing all its, its uh, citizens in this actually secure program because they are very afraid that should the terrorist attack happen, there would be an explosion of the discourse of religion in the public domain. It is something the sort of secular state Singapore has is not really to face because. If everyone talks about religion, then this, this separation is gone. So that's why you see they are... Hey. I can't go back. 
uh, they're, they're quite uh, obsessed about that. And if you look at Indonesia, especially after the fall of Suharto in 1998, due to this more decentralized framework where you have more diffuse power relations, uh, and that's why in terms of the security framework, especially on the counter-terror front, the state cannot be as so-called as strong and intimidating as Malaysia and even Singapore. And that's why a lot of security analysts are asking why Indonesia can't have its own ISA and so on and so forth. So in conclusion, uh, I don't think this is particular to Malaysia. Uh, national security and re regime security are almost interlinked uh, in Malaysia's security framework. And uh, unfortunately, by adopting a total approach, it has entrenched the discourse of race and religion within the security domain. So basically, anything that offends a particular race or something, it becomes a national security issue, which actually contradicts the government efforts, especially on the international stage, to sanitize Islam from its terror implications, because terrorism is defined in security terms and defined in, in religious terms. So that, that's to, that to me is the irony of it. So yeah, that's it.